much as I have. Now today's workshop is based on leadership and why we need more women to step forward. We have another great lineup for you. Firstly, we have our current CWU president, Karen Rose, personal executive member, sorry, <laughs> Katrina Quirk, and head of the CWU Education, sorry, Equality Education and Development Department, Kate Hudson. I hope, I'm just glad I don't have to say that every day. I've kept it to a short in, um, intro because hopefully we'll get some questions in at the end. So if I'd um, pass over to Karen Rose first. Thank you, Sheila. <clears throat> so basically the brief you've given me is to talk to you about the importance of leadership in the Count Me In campaign. But um, first of all, I kind of want to touch on actually one of my favorite quotes, right? So one of my favorite quotes was, um, never be a follower, be a leader, because one day you lead yourself to something extraordinary. And then when you apply that in CWU terms, of course, <clears throat> you have to remember that there's no good being a leader if nobody follows you. So <clears throat> one of the, and, and, and that's kind of where we started really with the Count Me In campaign. So we, it, it, it was quite a difficult call because I think that um, in BT for many, many years, we've had a reasonable relationship with the employer. And as a result, we've had decent pay rises, we've had fairly decent terms and conditions, and we haven't really had anything um, that would anger the members enough to be able to even have a dispute, let alone actually lead to a ballot for industrial action. But this time is very different. And so in kind of taking those decisions, what we had to take account of was that was that was that very thing that in order to lead people in the direction they have to have a reason to follow you and some of the difficulties that i think that we had to overcome in the first instance is that instinctively we knew where we needed to lead instinctively we knew that what we were facing was wrong and instinctively we knew that in order to combat that and do anything about it we had to lead our members into a point where they were angry enough for BT to recognise that our members would take action. And, and that was never going to be an easy thing to do because basically you had lots of people out there in, among our activists that had differing opinions about what we should be doing and when we should be doing it. And you know what? The truth is they're used to being leaders too. And they used to leading their people in the branches, in the local regions, and actually it's kind of, I suppose, like, for example, in the Northwest, and, and I had this conversation with Carla earlier. So in the Northwest, I do think that the branches are at a, at a degree of readiness, which is greater than elsewhere in the country. And because of that, quite clearly, the Northwest almost wanted to move ahead because they were already significantly halfway up the ladder. But elsewhere in the country, we've got branches which were nowhere near that. They haven't even started. They haven't even got to the first run of the ladder. Right? So what I was going to say is, um, what was important then is leadership on two fronts. So sometimes you leading doesn't necessarily mean that you're leading people in the direction that they're necessarily pushing that for me not in the context of what we do actually sometimes leadership is putting the brakes on in some places like we know that we've done with the northwest there's no doubt about that and in order for others to catch up and so what we had to do then is we had to put in an awful lot of resources and real push into some of those places where they really needed to up their game, basically, and to start to climb the ladder. So I, I, and I, and I genuinely do think, by the way, in this Count Me In campaign, particularly for us in the TNFS, because we haven't been in a position where we've had a dispute for a long time, actually getting ourselves in the position that we needed to be wasn't necessarily easy for us either. 
Because like I said, your instincts are telling you one thing, but you also know that what you need to do is not necessarily immediately do what your instincts are telling you. And I, and, I, and I do think that that is what I would call a judgment call. And it is a judgment call that sometimes you have to make when, when you're in that position. But what, I, I do want to say something about, um, about, about women in this, actually, because uh, this is, I think tonight has come as a really good time because last week we had um, some issues in BT and it was, we had one of our little round tables. And they and, they, and Tracy actually, Tracy Buckley was um, the chair of that uh, session. And what it was is a particular section of BT where they are deliberately targeting part timers <clears throat> um, in order to make them redundant, really, and to push them out of the business to say that they're no longer required. And as you would probably uh, expect, <clears throat> a significant proportion of those part timers are women. And in this particular area of work, there's an awful lot of women workers. And, and um, Angela, another uh, woman from the Northwest, <laughs> and you know, you have got some really great people in the Northwest, actually, haven't you? You know, and, I, and that's genuine, by the way, because it was Angela then who actually came to us at headquarters and said, um, could we do something to empower and mobilize women? And of course, Immediately, I mean, I was copied into that. Um, Tracy is the chair of the personnel team. I was copied into it um, as the chair of the constituency. And I thought, yeah, do you know what? We, we, we really could. We could do something for our women members because what we notice is that what I think is, is it, I, and I genuinely think this is important, I've always thought it, when I got involved in the union, um, it, 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 there was women in my branch and actually women in my region. Katrina was one of the women in my region and we had one of the, um, one of the very first um, regional women's committees and, and it was a place where you could go and you could share ideas with other women but also you looked up to other women. I looked up to people, um, or I certainly looked up to Katrina because she was a very prominent woman in our region and you know, did a huge amount of work for women. And for me, I think she was a leader. She was, she was a leader where I actually think that probably gave me inspiration because then Katrina, you did the bullying and harassment helpline Katrina and then ended up on the executive. And even though that was in a separate constituency, what it was, it was a role model. It was a role model for me as a woman in the region. And it was a role model for other women, um, you know, coming coming behind us in the region, and so I think that um, it is actually, you know, leadership is leadership is really important, right? But as I said from the very beginning, you have to have people to follow you, and I think in order to have people to to follow you, you have to inspire them to the point where actually they want to be like you. They see it as something that they can aspire to do. And so, you know, your, your kind of behavior and the justification in our organization, your behavior, the justification for everything you do has to be there. You have to be able, I think, to explain yourself and to explain your rationale, which, again, goes back to the Count Me In campaign. When we, when we go back to the very beginning, that, and like I said, uh, Tracy Buckley sits on the TFSE with me. And she will tell you that it was a real wrangle for us with our own thoughts, not with external thoughts, not what other people were telling us, and a wrangle with our own thoughts about what was the right thing to do. And we knew where we needed to get to, but it was a case of working out how you get there. And also, I think there's a responsibility in leadership. I think there's a responsibility to evaluate where you're going and what are the consequences of taking people in the direction that you're going. So you can't just lead blindly and say, follow, him, follow me and we'll see where we get. I think what you have to do is you have to consider where you're going, 
what the consequences of that will be, not just for you, but for the other people as well that you're leading, the people that are coming behind you. Um, uh, Karen Regan has just put a, um, a little message in the box that I can see, which says that she's trying to engage women and to get them more involved, but she's hitting a brick wall um, of apathy. And actually, do you know what? I can understand that. I can, I can understand that. Uh, when I got involved in the union a long, long time ago, I was in my 30s. Um, I, was a, I was a single parent. I only worked part time. I would never have ever been able to do what I've done in the union if I hadn't have had the support of my extended family and my parents in particular. And, um, and not everybody's got that. And also, I think as well, and one of the things about leadership is, number one, honesty. I think you have to give people inspiration. I also think you have to be an optimist because if people are following you, they have to believe it's because it's for something better. And um, I think you have to install confidence and you also have to be accountable. A bit like I said about if you're leading people, you have to know where you're taking them and what the consequences of that would be because you know, you have to be accountable. But in a way as well, you have to be, you have to be empathetic because you have to understand a bit like not everybody has got the support networks that, that you have got. Um, and you certainly have to be focused on what the goal is. Well, one of the things that I do think that we are not necessarily brilliant at in our organization, because I think we are so used to being, as union representatives, in calling out what's wrong. So we automatically call out what's wrong. And by calling out what's wrong, actually, that's quite a negative, that's quite a negative thing to do. And to give motivation and support to people, I think you almost have to have a very positive attitude because you have to get them to believe that there's something in it for them and that it'll be a force for good. Yeah, that, that's, that's some good points made there. Karen, thank you. I was going to just wrap up because I was keeping my eye on the clock, Sheila. Oh, okay, thank, yeah, thank you. you. <laughs> um, I am a bit worried about time. It could, um, could I bring in Katrina? Yeah, uh, thanks, Sheila. Good evening, everyone. Um, well, listening to Karen is an inspiration. And I, my brief was to talk about being a woman on, on the PE. But I think first and foremost, I'll give you a little bit of background um, about myself. I started in Royal Mail in 87. Um, I was a unit rep in 88. Part of the first uh, draft dispute led 200 delivery postmen out on strike uh, back in 88. Um, done my first big gate meeting, if you like, to get people back to work. We were out quite a long time there. Um, part of, as Karen said, the Regional Women's Committee, when we then merged, uh, became part of the WAC, uh, where the actual officer, who was a female at, at that time, did not want to actually attend the Women's Advisory Committee. She sent along her PA, um, but us at that time, uh, a number of very strong postal women weren't having any of that. And we said, no, if we can have the officer, we definitely don't want the PA. We, we want to put our points over. So as a group of women, young women in a new union, i.e. Uh, the CWU, we were strong and we ensured that that officer came to our first uh, Women's Advisory Committee. Um, through the years, I've been a speaker for the CWU on Springboard, where I have encouraged numerous women to come into the CWU and become active. But I think one of the most important uh, parts I've played in the birth of the CWU is the Women's Conference. Um, I was the one who moved the motion for the Women's Conference. I led the leafleting that we did outside conference to ensure that we got that motion carried. It then became a motion-based conference and we had the other equality conferences going on. 
Um, as mentioned, I worked on the help on the harassment helpline where I dealt with a number of horrendous cases, one especially where a woman was tied to the chair, sexually assaulted, threatened with a knife, and without the support of other women, that woman would have fallen apart. She didn't have support from a branch. She didn't have any other support apart from the harassment helpline and myself. So when, when you look at the support that you give to other woman, women coming through, if you like, the, the, the road to where I am today, it's been quite difficult but it's also been very rewarding because of helping those women and asking women to join you, getting on that bus to go to the first women's conference with a, a, a busload of not women activists, just women off the floor of your workplace um, who didn't know anything about unions, didn't know anything about anything else, but were willing to come with you, even if they thought it was going to be a day out in London. They were in, in for a shock. They spent the day in Friends Meeting House at the first uh, meeting, the informal meeting of, of women of the CWU, which was organised by Jenny Ainsley. So that, that's a little bit of background. Um, and... I now want to talk about how difficult it was to actually get elected to the postal executive because it, it's not just a stepping stone to get to the uh, postal executive. As anyone in the, in the postal section will know with what happened last year when all the women were, were not elected to the National Executive Council, we were elected to the postal executive but we lost two people, two females, off the um, national executive. And that was to do with getting certain individuals, and, you know, I'm going to be honest, it, it was men, getting certain men elected to the NEC. That should never be allowed to happen again. But, um, you know, I digress. So... I wasn't elected. It took me about three or four years to get elected to the postal executive. However, I didn't give up. I pursued it. I pursued what I wanted, to be perfectly honest. And once I was elected, I ensured that whatever work I was doing, I always took women with me. Because being a member of the postal executive, you get to lead on a number of joint working groups. Um, for instance, I lead, at the moment, I'm leading on six joint working groups. Um, I look after the whole of Parcel Force. I have everything to do with Parcel Force. I look at, after all the RDCs. I look at an evaluation strand. Um, I look at resourcing technology. I'm on the culture and buildings. I look after the uniforms. I look after Quadrant. That's just to name a few. But what I always ensure that I do, because we can have lay people on those working groups, I always ensure I encourage women to come on. I use their knowledge because I, I'm not the font of all knowledge. I like to use the people around me and use their expertise. However, what I always ensure is that they get credit for any ideas they get acknowledgement that they're on that group and I always insist that they get thanks and that their names are, in men are, are mentioned. The, the other thing on the, the postal executive is you must have an opinion. You can't just sit there and nod. And even if other people don't like your opinion, then that's a shame. You're, you are elected by the membership to have an opinion and it's your right to sit at that executive and say your opinion and that's important and I would always encourage women uh, and men because you know let, let's be honest some men have difficulties in the, in the workplace and, and they need a helping hand as well on on occasion. Um, so on, on the postal executive you've got um, what, what we do is we have documents, we make decisions, we have in committees, we talk about things. Um, tomorrow and Thursday, we've got a two day in committee where we will be talking about the future of what's gonna be happening in the postal industry. But I think what, what we've got to think about is 
and it's probably on people's mind, is that we've been involved in two, two ballots for industrial action over the last three years. Um, did I vote for those ballots for industrial, uh, industrial action on, on the postal executive? Of course I did. And it would have been wrong of me not to, because what the business are trying to do is undermine every agreement that this union has. They are trying to take away everything that we, who are fighting now and what our predecessors have fought for in this union. And it's important that we keep what we've got. Our terms and conditions are, are fought, have been fought for, we want to keep improving them. On the issue of um, priorities and what we should be doing going forward, the business want new ways of working. Could there be another dispute? They could. Um, do I think it's going to be this year? No, I don't. Because in my opinion, and this would be my voice on the postal executive, now would not be the time to ballot the membership again. The simple reason being that we wouldn't be able to go out on strike because of covid and everything else that's going on um, out in, in the outside world, world, outside of this. But make no mistake, if we don't stand up to this business, to Royal Mail, they will try and take away everything from us. And when I say everything, I mean everything. Our, our sick, our terms, conditions, at the moment they don't want to touch MTSF, but you know, if they get rid of the amount of people that they think they want to get rid of, they're not going to give us good MTSF terms now. And something I go back to, when I first started in 87, we just separated. Um, the GPO had just separated. We'd become Royal Mail and the Telecoms. And if you look at history, you will see everything that's happened in Telecoms is about 10 years behind happening in Royal Mail. And make no mistake, that will happen to us unless we stand strong and fight now. Um, ju just to go on, on from the quote that, that Karen said, always be a leader, not a follower. The only way we can be good leaders is to ensure that we do have people following us. Because if people don't listen to us and understand what we're trying to do for the future of the CWU, then nobody's going to follow us. You know, you look at Terry Pullinger, he, he's brilliant. He gets up on that rostrum and he fights the fight. He shouts, he got his fist going and he bangs. Yet in the next breath, he can be calm and collective. You know, T Terry can get up there and give it to the best, which he does. But this is about women. We've got Jane. Jane will get up there and give it her best, um, you know, when she's asked. But I think as a woman on the postal executive, was I ever unsure of voicing my opinion? Of course I did. Did that stop me voicing my opinion? Of course it didn't. Because if I can't say it in that room, where can I say it? If I can't say it to the membership of the postal side of the CWU, where can I say it? If women want to come on to the postal executive, it's not easy, but it is rewarding. You get to be involved in the decisions and most, the majority of the decisions are good decisions that are gonna improve people's lives. And what better uh, thought can you have than helping to improve people's working lives and that's without looking of what uh, what we do centrally that's just on on the postal side so something for you to think about um, is a quote from um, Wangari Mathaya the first African women woman to win the Nobel Peace Prize prize and what she said was finally I was able to see that I had a contribution I wanted to make. I must do it despite what others said, that I was okay the way I was, that it was all right to be strong. And some, some of us as women think we, we haven't got a right to be strong. We haven't got a right to voice opinion. 
And let me tell you now, we have. We have the same rights as everybody else. And we shouldn't shy away just because we don't comply or conform with other people's opinion. Doesn't make us wrong. We might have better ideas. And that, I believe, is what makes a good leader. And, you know, being a woman from the postal side, I've been on the executive since 2008. I'm proud to be on that executive. Um, it, it, it's something I fought for and obviously I, I gained. Is it important that we bring ev other women forward? Of course it is. And if you don't get involved, you're not going to get there. What I would say to all women is think about what you want to do. Think about what road you want to go down. And if you feel that a national position is for you, then you should follow that road. If you want to be in the region, if you want to be in your branch, there's nothing wrong with being a, you know, a great leader in your branch. As I said, my first leadership role was taking 200 men out of a delivery office on strike. I was the only woman, I, I was their rep. They voted for me over other men to, to have that position. I think that's one of the biggest achievements I've ever made, to be perfectly honest. And, you know, that was back in 88. That's a long time ago when, when you think of things. Um, what, what else can we say about it? Katrina, could I just, sorry, <laughs> um, I'm just conscious of time, that's all. Sorry. <laughs> it's I've a, got apples. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was very interesting and thank you very much. Um, no, can I bring Katie in? Kate, sorry. Yeah. It's okay. <laughs> Thanks. And, and, you know, it just shows even like with the sessions we've had online over the last couple of days, you know, these discussions are, are always worthwhile and we always run out of time because we've always got so much to say. But I'll try and keep it brief, you know. Um, so, look, you know, my brief was to basically come in and talk about the Women's Leadership Programme, what that offers, and just to talk about women in leadership in general. And I do think it's an important debate and a timely debate. I mean, you know, in, at the moment, improving gender balance in unions and in union leadership, especially bringing women through to decision-making bodies, is vitally important. And also, we've got to recognise that we have an increase in women's membership. And without women coming through, we are almost at the risk of looking outdated and out of touch with our membership. So we have to recognise that and look at how, how we are perceived as a union. Um, you know, and, and to be honest, to have roles within a union that do seem unattainable to some women, I don't feel can no longer be accepted. Um, you know, I, I, was, I always read up on stuff, obviously, when I get the chance, Zoom tends to have, have knocked some of that time out a little bit. But, um, I was reading up the other day about a survey that was conducted 10 years ago and it said the three biggest barriers um, facing women from taking up leadership roles in trade unions um, was basically work-life balance, the unequal sharing of family responsibilities and preconceived stereotyped ideas concerning the role of women leading and the attempts to dissuade them. And then I started thinking to myself, of them three barriers actually being removed 10 years on? And I don't think they have, I think they're still there. Um, you know, and th there's many a barrier to women's progression into leadership. It's the culture of unions. It's the male dominated environment where issues are often decided unofficially before you even get into the decision making body of the room. You know, um, women do tend to hold themselves back and oh, I'm my biggest critic, for instance, um, and often lack confidence to push forward into leadership roles. Um, but another barrier, I believe, and this is something we've been talking about with my team at the moment, is the lack of knowledge about union structures and how to actually get into some of these positions. You know, when we talk about the development of mentoring and leadership programmes, it's vital to bring women through from a grassroots member to a representative, almost creating, I think, a pathway. So currently, in the current leadership programme we have for women, um, in the CW, we look at a range of activities which include discussion around inspirational women in our own movement, in our own union. Um, we talk about identifying leadership skills and qualities. And we ask women to consider, you know, um, what it looks like to be well represented in trade unions, and the representation of women. Is, is our union woman friend, women friendly? 
um, et cetera, and all these type of things, and to identify and discuss barriers, but also how to overcome them barriers. When I think you get women in a room, that's a real worthy conversation. It's a bit like what we're doing now. We're talking about how to get over a barrier or how to get around it, because there's always a way. Um, however, again, these are discussions I've had with my team in the last few months, last few weeks. Um, I do think more could be done with those leadership programs. So, for instance, we need, a, like I said, a women's course that runs from grassroots membership to a representative level, like, almost like a pathway. So even down to minor details, like how to fill in your bi biographical details when you've never held a position, how to apply for a role, what it's like to suddenly go through. I mean, the first thing we do, I always remember Lynn Brown has said this to me many a time over the years. As soon as a woman comes interested, one of the first things we do is go, right, you've now got to stand in that election and go through this procedure, which they probably don't understand. And, um, you know, it's, it's just so off-putting in itself. So offering courses, I think, to female members um, about what we do as well as a union and to grow their confidence, not only in the ability to step forward, but also in the ability to understand our structures, um, you know, and how to move forward in that women's pathway, I think is vitally important. Um, and it's something that I can be quite pleased to say in my role that we can look at. <laughs> so, you know, it's great to suddenly be at this stage where rather than going, I want to do this, I want to do that, I can do this and I can do that, which is absolutely brilliant. So I want to see a course that offers a programme for existing female reps, but also for potential future reps. And I think there is definitely a case to do that. You know, and working with our regional leads, working with some of you that are on this call, I do think that we can cover that. And also different roles have different remits at different levels of our union. And we need to understand that. I mean, I always and still get at times guilty around the fact that I was at the time, not the first, but I was at the time the only regional secretary, female regional secretary. And every time I see the statistic that we've gone back to 10 male regional secretaries, sometimes I feel a bit guilty about stepping away from that. And I, I definitely feel um, guilty in myself almost that there wasn't a female to come through after me. And believe me, I tried, but there, there just wasn't women that felt confident enough to step in that role. Um, but again, I got to the point in my union career, I suppose, where I thought to myself, I can't keep asking women to step forward if I'm not prepared to do it myself. I think it gets to a point where you have to show almost that leadership. And it's not an easy thing to do, but we have to show that women can step up and women can get there. And going back to Katrina's point, which was a, is a vital point as a woman um, who was, I was a distribution rep, which was, you know, 99% male. I think there's a lot of power, and this goes back to the pathway with women, about talking to the membership. Because when you can learn how to talk to the membership on the front line, whether it's around a dispute, whether it's around equality, doesn't matter what it is, if you can learn how to do that, the power of you moving through this union is in the membership. It's not in the branches, and it's not in, in the reps and the people that make decisions, which they do, about who's going to go for what role and do what. Um, you know, and that was one of the greatest things I ever learned, was about the power of the membership and just getting overcoming that barrier. Um, I always say the greatest, and I've, I've, I've said this before, the greatest leaders, I feel, are the ones that take pride in the people to follow. And all of us who have spoken tonight, I've said that, but just in different words. So, you know, I, I do say as well, women are not just. How many times do you hear women say, I'm just a women's officer, or, I'm just a health You're not a just. Women are never a just in the trade union movement. They're never a just in the seed of you. They're a must. They're a must to show women that you can come through. And there are a must to put your hands out and bring them through with you. And do you know what? I'm going to end on this line. Um, when I've seen the comments come up about reserve seats, we should never be afraid to debate. But when we debate, because that's what we do with trade unionists, we get in a room and debate. But when we debate and have these discussions, it should be about what we're going to do to make it better, not always about just what the problem is. I think that's the key. But I've got to say, you know, one thing I've learned over the years and I stick by, we're definitely stronger together and we need to, we need to do that more often. I'll leave it there. <laughs> okay, thank you, Kate. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Kate. Now, I've got Sue Jo. I think Kevin Regan wanted to come in, I'm not sure, and Katie Dunning. So first of all, I'll go to Sue.
Oh yeah. <laughs> um, I've used that quote from you, Kate. Um, <laughs> ever since we met at the uh, leadership course last year, I've had to correct myself a few times. I'm not just a software. I am a must. Um, so basically, after that course, I took more, a lot more of an interest in what was happening with the union. I think that NEC ballot in particular was one of the first that I took most notice in. So um, at the time I was doing a little study about how our union helps women and obviously in that category there was only four women out of I think 17 candidates and so there was another like 13 men in all and obviously like we've said and we've noticed that none of them actually got elected onto the NEC which actually really disappointed me at the time <clears throat> for somebody who didn't really take much notice of it in, in before and then to, to suddenly see how difficult it was for women um, you know I want to know if Katrina could tell us how she felt about that and what we can do to to encourage more women to come forward i mean it put a fire in my belly if i'm honest i was fuming about it and i thought well you know there's a gap that needs filling perhaps i could go there but obviously like kate was saying a lot of us don't actually know what the structures are what those jobs entail and where we can go with it so i think eventually i will probably put myself forward into those kind of roles but um looking at it from the uh, ballot itself it doesn't look like women have got that much chance and we're not really represented at a higher level i know there's still a few got into the pc but yeah that's that's where i'm at with that one if anyone can help thank you. okay thank you sue um, Joe, do you want to come in? Hi everyone. Um, I would love to have the debate about reserve seats. When I first um, heard the term reserve seats, I was definitely against it. I thought there's no way that I want a position just because of my gender. I want to prove that you know I'm worthy of the role, that I, I can do the job that I'm applying for. But the more that I've seen, and I think there's a general understanding that we're not proportionate in terms of our membership yet. I think we do need to do something radical. We need to maybe follow the TUC approach and put reserve seats in place. The best thing about the CWU and the way that we hold our um, sovereign body conferences is that if it doesn't work, we can change it again. We have the ability to adapt our rule book. And I think if we do that so that it becomes the norm that women will have a reserve seat at every level of leadership in the CWU. Eventually we won't need reserve seats because there'll be enough women out there seeing themselves be reflected in our leadership and that will become the new norm. That, that's my hope and I really would love the opportunity to discuss this further because as I say, I've, I've gone from one extreme to the other in the past. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Joe And Katie? Yeah, typically, I've just rubbed my eye and I've got a black eye, so I do apologise. Um, this my question's aimed at Katrina. Um, Katrina, over the years we've seen many different women's policies go through our conference body. Policies around um, introducing women's workplace policies, improving family uh, friendly arrangements and flexibility arrangements. Um, given that there's only a small number, I mean, and many of these motions have gone through conference from our, our women's leaders. Um, given that there's only a small proportion of women on the PC, has that impacted negatively in negotiations, i.e. are we addressing and considering some of the policies of our union, particularly around the need for better family friendly arrangements, even if we do get the single shorter working week? Um, and if we're not, if they're not part of the negotiations, what can we do as regional, um, what can our quality leads do and what can our member, women members do to try and get this put on the agenda? Oh, okay, thank you. Um, Cam, do you want to come back in first? Me? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, to, to be honest, I won't, I mean, obviously Katie's question that she just posed was directed, it was a post-executive question. Yeah. So um, I'm not going to um, touch on the specifics of that, but I do want to respond to that because, look, there's been a huge um, 
uh, study right across the business world which actually demonstrates that companies that have women on boards actually perform financially a lot better than, um, than companies that don't, right? And there must be a reason for that. And I don't think that can be exclusively to business, right? So I definitely think that not having women at every level in a trade union would be a detrimental thing to the overarching thing. And it's not, it's not just about women, it's not just about women members. It's about what women bring to the table in um, business, and, and I think that would follow through in our trade union organisation. And I think we've got some great role models in the trade union. You know, you look at Frances O'Grady and you kind of see it, and she is an inspirational woman, and I think that's made a difference in the TUC. So I just want to say that bit, but on the bit that Jo um, uh, mentioned, um, I, I never, ever thought that I would see the day when I was an advocate of reserve seats. When the Labour Party first did it back in the 90s, I was absolutely opposed to it. And I had arguments with people in my branch when we went on delegations to Labour Party conference, um, uh, you know, because I argued, like Joe, that, um, you know, I was somebody that was going to get down the merits. I didn't need a seat with a badge on it that said woman, and for people to just think I got it because I was a woman, right? But I changed my mind. I've seen what's happened in the Labour Party. I've seen how that has brought women through. And the point that Joe makes, which is, um, you know, at some point we won't need them anymore because we'll have achieved what we would have achieved. I absolutely agree with that as well. And actually, we have already started the debate on the NEC. At the last NEC we had, which was a couple of weeks ago, we started talking about proportionality. Kate, I'm sure she'll speak for herself, and I don't want to steal her thunder, but she presented a discussion uh, document to us on proportionality. And I know Katie um, in the research department, you know, has done a lot of work um, on that. There is definitely, I think, much more of a mood for some kind of positive action. I don't know what that is. That doesn't necessarily mean it's reserved seats, but I think there is much more of a mood and a move towards the fact that we need positive action now than there was before. And, and on the last point was the point that Sue um, made. Um, I genuinely cried. I cried when no women got elected to the NEC from the Brussels constituency. Well, other than us, and because obviously the Vice President at the moment, she, I mean, she is the only woman now on the NEC. I, I cried. I thought that was an absolutely dreadful, dire day. Um, some of the women that have sat around that NEC table in the years that I've been on there, which is a long time since I first got elected to the NEC in 2004, um, but some of the women from the Brussels constituency that I've seen sit around that NEC table with me have been some of the most fantastic contributors to some of the debates um, that I've seen. And, and genuinely, they are missed. They are absolutely missed on the NEC now. And I hope, I really, really hope that in the next election, we will be able to do something to put that right. Thank you, Karen. Katrina, would you like to come in? Yeah, yeah. Um, how, how did we... The four, um, the three women who didn't get elected to the NEC, two of them were knocked off, devastated, tears, um, and then the the fury came after the initial upset. If if that makes sense, um, we were all annoyed. We felt we'd been done a disservice in as much as um, that there, there was a plan to ensure certain individuals got elected and they carried out that plan. It was done by branches, not every branch in the country, but a number of branches ensured they did not have women on their lists. No women at all on the um, recommendations coming from branches. That, that's what happened. We have got to try and ensure it doesn't happen again because I, I believe, and, and you know, my, my fellow PE members at the time felt it was a big step backwards for redesign. We were trying to take the union forward. And what happens? The first time, the first uh, election after redesign, you have no women elected to the NEC. What you've got to remember about Jane is Jane is elected first and foremost as chair of the postal executive she gets her nec position as a right of holding that position that she holds 
So yeah, we, we were annoyed. We were upset. Um, on Katie's um, question about you know workplaces, family friendly. We have been negotiating on it. We have discussed it on the NEC and we have tried to take it forward. But I think what you've got to remember is for two years, we didn't talk to the business. We haven't spoken. We didn't talk to the business about anything. Um, all the equality strands that they had with Royal Mail um, that Jane led on, Shelley was sitting on, that they just stopped having those meetings. So anywhere where we wanted to change policy or move policy forward, we didn't get the opportunity because the business stopped talking to us. They've only just started talking to us now. The first joint statement came out in July. That is an overarching joint statement. When we get into longer um, discussions and negotiations, that's when we will be looking at those policies. But before we get into them, we've got to get the framework right for these negotiations. As I touched on earlier, the talks are not going brilliantly at the moment. They're going to recommence next week. But it is something that it is PEC policy. When it's discussed at the PEC, any motions that come from conference, any conference will come to the PEC and we will then agree it and try and pursue it with the business. So it's not that we haven't tried to do it, it's just that they've stopped speaking to us on, on those issues. Um, on the reserve seats, we, we need to go back and have a debate, don't we? We've, we've had debates um, in the past and I remember moving a motion on reserve seats um, back probably 1990 I got absolutely slaughtered I think I only had about three three branches voting for it with me but still we went up there and we did it we need to debate it we need to take people forward on on that issue to see exactly what can be gained and what would be lost because there are women in this union and we shouldn't forget this that would not stand for a reserved seat and we could actually lose women by forcing reserved seats in in certain aspects um i i've been i suppose a bit bit of a yo-yo on on the issue of reserved seats back it, as i said in the 90s i, I uh, moved a motion on it got hammered going forward then I've changed my mind get that on your merit you, you know blah 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 but after what happened in the, in the election um, 18 months ago it needs looking at doesn't it because you can't have people being undermined like that and that's what we're done that was what was done to the PE members we were undermined so that certain individuals could be elected to the NEC they didn't want to do it the hard way. You come on the PEC and then you work your way up and you get the experience and go on the NEC. They wanted to go straight in at NEC level. And, you, you know, it was women who suffered for it. But I, I think that, you know, what, what is important, just to finish on, on this point, what, what is important is if we speak to other women, we encourage um women and sometimes just listening to women or bring them on um, a discussion can make all the difference and um, my thoughts on on leadership are we're all women together we can achieve anything and everything together and why why wouldn't we want to do that so hopefully i've covered everything off there Okay, thank you, Katrina. Um, I've just got um, Tracy and Mel wanted to have a quick word. Can I bring them in before you, Kate? Okay, Mel. Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say, um, like, thanks for these events. Um, I'm relatively new, really, um, rep-wise. Maybe it's five years that I've been a rep. Um, but I was elected last year onto the EE national team um, where three quarters of us are women, um, which is really good. Um, and I just want to say thanks because every single person on here inspires me all the time, um, in particular, Joe Shafto and Karen. 
Um, so I think these events have been really, really good. And obviously being empowered gives me um, the empowerment, if you like, to go ahead and bring more women reps into our branch. Um, so yeah, just thanks. Yeah, thank you, Mel. Tracy? Um, just a really quick point. I, I won't cover the things that I wanted to cover because I'm conscious of time, but just a really quick point to make in that, um, like everybody else, I was devastated to see what happened um, with the, on the, the postal elections. But bizarrely, on the telecom side, the telecoms executive, actually, women are reasonably rep represented on the telecoms executive. There's four of us. So it's the, probably the only place in the union where women proportionally um, are represented. That doesn't mean we're, that women are, are proportionally represented throughout the rest of the union structures on the um, telecom side, but actually the telecoms executive with four women out of um, the 12 or 13 of you, in, in, when we include Karen as the chair, we actually um, do make the cut. And, I just wanted to make that point because it, it was coming over that, that, that our executive structures, there were no women um, in them and, and there clearly is in some of them. Okay, okay, thank you, Tracy. Kate? Just about to see Tracy there. <laughs> it's like the on my light. It's <laughs> an electric bill. I have, it's the bloody, it's the bloody camera on my, my laptop. I, you can see it disappearing, oh. can't you? Well, I'll keep it. I feel like I'm part of the Queen video. I'm a good one today. I'm a good one. Okay, so to Susie from the Midlands, Susie, I, I know you have got so much to offer, and I've seen you overcome barriers in the way that you speak, spoken at events over the last couple of years, and I've seen where you grow. What you need to decide now is um, where you want to go next, and and you know, and start talking. You can talk to people like myself. Anybody on this group would talk to you about how to overcome barriers and what our structures look like. You know, so. We need to do that with Joe, and I've always seen myself, probably an unspoken thing, but I've always seen myself as coming through at a similar time to Joe, like, you know, from when we first became active. And I've, I agree with you, Joe. I've changed my view um, around positive action. And the reason I'm going to use the word po positive action is because whenever we say positive action, I'm always conscious that the first thing this goes to is reserved seats, right? But there's other things that we can do that's under that title of positive action that doesn't necessarily mean reserve seats. So I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm saying I'm prepared to, to now go back into the debate because do you know what? I think this union's got an appetite for it. And I think that people are ready to start discussing what positive action means. And even under you know, the general rules, I think it's point six, it actually states in there that this union will put in positive action until our structures reflect our whole membership. The fact that I know that is just, <laughs> It's just, it's amazing that, you know, you pick these things up at different levels of the union. So what I'm saying is positive action can come in all forms, all shapes and all sizes. And I do think we need to have that debate as a union. Um, you know, just on that point could be about giving time to roles. It could be about the facilities that you get. There's all different ways. But like I said, I'm happy to open that debate. I will say this, though. If what happened in the last NEC election, elections ever happens again in this union, it will be devastating. Mm. I don't think we'll ever get over it and that's why it's it's good to have these discussions and good to have these debates and i think there's an appetite for it and i think you know we should push forward with this these these discussions and we shouldn't be afraid to do so i'll leave it there i'll be good thank you kate uh, i'd like um, to thank everyone for joining us tonight hope you found it interesting um, we'll be sending out some uh, feedback forms for everyone to fill in and um, this would be appreciated. I'm not sure that, um, well sorry, I'm sure you've all appreciated the hard work and time which has been put into the workshops. So I'd like to say a big thank you to everyone that has taken part in this journey like Jean Charix, Angela Connell and Vera Kelsley but they're speaking on the What event which introduced us to the workshops. Bez and the author Sib Sybil Hodges for a tremendous book review on Trafficked, A Diary of the Sex Slave, which gave us a great insight to the underground world that made victims of many mothers, daughters and sisters a true inspiration. Now, Karen Kendricks has not just worked hard to bring us the two great assertive workshops and tested out the new tech for us, but she's both 
both with Emma Gardner and Carl Webb have supported me working behind the scenes and have done a fantastic job advertising and pushing the Women of Today events and workshops. And of course, I can't forget Amy Reckley, Reckley sorry, <laughs> for designing the banners used for advertising this series. I'd also like to thank Katie Dunn and Kerry Flett but Fleck, sorry, for, for the interesting and informative proportionality workshop. It went down the storm and really started off the conversation. In fact, it inspired Karen Regan so much. She wrote to her women members, encouraging them to step forward. So a big thank you for Karen for that. A special can, um, thank you for today's guests, Karen, Katrina and Katie, for just for tonight, but for all the work they do for us in the wider CWU. And then last but not least, I'd like to thank all the guys who have um, joined and supported us along the way. It's been really appreciated and thank you. I'll just let, uh, I'll just let our regional secretary, Carl Webb, have the last few words. Carl? Thank you, Sheila. You basically covered everything I was going to say, but uh, a big thank you to you. Sheila, I mean, you've took on the role of Regional Leads Officer, supported by Karen, and you've hit the ground running, and you're a great example of what redesign can achieve. And uh, I think I've, I've really enjoyed it. I've, I've been putting messages on the uh, chat, and I realised I've only been sending them to Fedzi. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I just want to say, the, I put something on there about the three speakers. I've got to say, the three speakers, excellent. And I mean that sincerely. Uh, I've been around uh, <coughs> a very long time. And I, I remember Katrina working on the helpline and all the help and advice she gave with Leslie and that, and all the help and support they gave people. It was a great initiative. So uh, and I, you know, I'm getting to know Karen. And obviously, I know Kate really well because obviously we work very closely as, as regional secretaries. And so I just want to say to everybody involved, Thank you for supporting Sheila. Um, thank you for coming on these calls. I know there's going to be other events because Karen and Sheila won't stop here. Uh, and I'm hoping uh, we'll get a few more people from the Northwest region to come on because I think uh, Karen put a comment. Some of you wouldn't have seen it, but Karen put a comment, not Karen Reagan, that he's put a comment on one of the WhatsApp groups saying you should really be supporting these two inspirational women who've organised these events, and she's absolutely spot on. So, thank you very much, Sheila. Thank you all. And, um, hopefully you'll get to see the new event. In, when is it? Um, the, oh, I've forgotten which one it is. On, on the Facebook at half past seven. Karen? Your oh. workers. Young yeah. workers at seven yeah. I knew they were short and I was down for. <laughs> yeah. A few of us will be on that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye, Bye Karen. Bye.